stay connected to your network, stay connected to the veteran network. And the second thing is understand your value. You want to talk about going through hell? Well, this gentleman did right here. So I'm excited to have this conversation with Major Scott A. Husing, Devil yeah. Dog, Mustang, which means enlisted to officer, mad respect. Talking about Iraq's deadliest city. Sir, I need to call you that because mad respect from us. <laughs> so what motivated you to put this stuff in a book? Because most guys coming out, they don't want to talk about it. Yeah, what's great about this here at Clever Talk Two is these are guys sharing their stories. Mm -hmm. and, and not everybody has that capacity to share their story. Not everybody has to write a book about it. Some people get on a stage and tell it, but I think it's important that we tell these stories. And in this day and age, especially through so many different mediums, through shows, podcasts, there's so many venues where we can tell these stories about our young servicemen and women, the heroic things they've done, and even some of the more mundane things. I think those are very interesting stories because right. not everybody's kicking doors in a Ramadi. Right. Some guys are fixing planes or scraping paint off ships, yeah. but their service matters. And to highlight that and not wait 50 years, right. Matt, like we did. To process the, it out. To, not right. only to process it, but our Vietnam veterans yeah. uh, who are out there, and if you're listening, welcome home. Yes. I, I think we we have a responsibility to this generation to make sure we're sharing these stories. And I was just reading uh, the, the backdrop of your book there. You're part of 15 Marine, Marine Expedition Unit. I was part of 15 Marine Expedition Unit, part of the MUSOC. Uh, the units you're a part of, what was your role? Was, 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 were you in command with? Uh, I was the commander of Echo Company, 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines during the surge strategy in 06. And we were part of the 15th Marine Expedition Unit that took us over there. And then General Abizade ultimately committed the theater reserve, which was the 15th MU afloat. Mm -hmm. and once we were committed in theater, all of the infantry units were spread out to go support those pockets of resistance, that insurgent activity that had been popping up. And yep. The analogy I use like, it was like a giant game of whack-a-mole where we had to hammer the Point, insurgents something down. came up? Yep, we'd hammer them down and then they'd pop back up. So the surge allowed us to flood that battle space with an additional 20,000 troops. Wow. And I was a commander of one of the Marine units in yep. Ramadi, nice. over 250 Marines, soldiers and sailors as we fought alongside our Army brothers. Check that out. When you're going through that uh, process of, okay, I'm in charge of these things. I remember my, my first deployment, 18 years old, going to Somalia. And I remember them saying, you know, so Paul, go downstairs to legal. You're 18 years old. Make sure you SGLI is in force. Make sure you sign your will with legal. 30% of you guys aren't coming home. We're like, how does, how, what is the burden of that to a commander? Well, it's not a class you can take. I think that from entry level training as a young enlisted Marine to becoming an officer, I think that the training that we do get prepares us well, but how do you prepare 250, 18, 19 year old kids to do that one life changing decision to take another human life? How do you prepare them for that? How do you prepare them for seeing death on a scale that we did during the some of the bloodiest fighting in modern urban combat in Ramadi. Hopefully you do it through leadership, and that's not just my leadership, Matt. That's leadership at every level. Right. And I think institutionally, as a Marine Corps, as a military, we do a very good job of that because we recruit in only the best people, and you're, you're part of that. Mm -hmm. You're less than one half of 1% of the entire American population that ever served their country. And that's absolutely something to be proud of. But to instill that type of mindset to prepare your your young men and women to deal with those types of pieces of trauma mm -hmm. uh, on such a grand scale is it's really a daily challenge but you have the support of everyone around you to do it you know i just realized that he's also from waukegan illinois 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 marine corps brothers here yeah but uh how come you didn't go back to illinois you, you stayed out here yeah so after, after well i did after okay, my, oh, you did? okay so oh, for, to, to get your i did yeah college so I barely squeaked out of high school. This is not, <laughs> not a true confession. I've heard this on uh, a lot of radio and media, but barely got out of high school. I had a smoking hot 1.24 GPA out of walking in West. Very good. <laughs> yeah, thanks. So the Marine Corps was a natural fit. I enlisted, decided the error of my ways, and, and got accepted to Illinois State University, which I love Illinois State. I just was asked to speak there uh, really? last month. What was your MOS in the, as an enlisted? I was uh, 0331 and uh, 7222. Yeah, it started off as yeah. a Stinger uh, Hawk guy nice. and then as a machine gunner. Nice. But to go back to Illinois State and speak, I, I was very proud because, mm. you know, they only let in a select 30 or 40,000 people every year. So I was just happy to get into college. And when I did, I graduated in three years with a much more respectful GPA. And then that propelled me back 
into the officer ranks because I still wanted to serve. I still was committed to the Marine Corps and serving yeah. my country and became an officer. And yeah. after serving on all the right billets and responsibility, mm -hmm. some 15 years later as a, as a captain with a lot of life experience and, and several combat deployments under my belt, then I was ultimately thrust into the, the streets of Ramadi. Check that out. Yeah. So what, what would you hope that service members, veterans, would get from your book? Well, when I initially launched the book, it was all about telling the stories of the people and those that fought, not just the Marines and soldiers, but our families mm -hmm. and our amazing Gold Star families that lost so much. I mean, there's only one word I ever use to describe them that's extraordinary. But as we've moved into the sixth month, the book has become a bestseller. And Congratulations. I, I know, so it's proud great, of It's great. 1.24. Right, 1.24 GPA, there's hope for you guys out One there. 1.24 GPA, yeah. the best-selling author. To receive the feedback from yeah. not only veterans, but families, and sometimes complete strangers, I, I think the message has really changed to how this book is not about this, this bad-ass Marine on the cover looks mm -hmm. like he's gonna kick your door in, but it's about people and the power of human connection and how it's affected so many people and how it's impacted so many people mm -hmm. over the last six months since we launched this book. And that's what's really yep. been the most gratifying to me as an artist, as a writer, yep. and as a veteran to yep. get an email from a total stranger yes. mm -hmm. or from a guy that I wrote about in the book and then they email me and they say, that was me. I was in that explosive ordnance unit. Yeah. That was me that cleared that sector for you. And I didn't even know their name at the time, but they recognized themselves. Yeah. It's pretty powerful to have that type of impact. And it makes me humble every single time I receive a letter or an email yeah. like that. It's, just, it's phenomenal. The title, Echo in Ramadi, is that Echo Company? Echo is that what you're Company. talking about? It? Is that you came up with the title? It is. And we were Echo Company, but also, you know, the book resonates echoes of war and some of the lingering effects that a lot of our veterans deal with yeah. and I think that was an important message that I had to share as well is it's not all shiny metals and bumper stickers and blazing into battle against a inferior untrained enemy there's a lot of friction on the battlefield to deal with and then when you leave there's remaining friction there's a remaining residue of combat this post-combat residue that a lot of veterans have to deal with after experiencing the worst of humanity and the worst that war has to offer and, and how they deal with those little pieces of trauma and unfortunately sometimes it's suicide and, and I've lost you know five Marines in my company alone to suicide and, and it's uh, yeah. it was tough to write about it's tough yeah. to talk about obviously but uh, when I called the families and said is it alright to share this story every single one of them said yes you have to share that because it's that important not to say that you've gotten over, over a lot of things that you've been through but uh, how do you process it how do you process and purge and, and deal with it this yeah this it, it yeah. really is uh, a good friend of mine Josh Collins who's a special forces soldier is, he, he couldn't have said any better it, it, the cure is in the connection yeah. and, and is staying connected, staying involved in events like Clever Talks, being open to expand outside of the military network because you, you never thought you were as close as you were in the military. There'd never be any bigger brotherhood or sisterhood, but you know now, yeah. right? You get outside those circles and they just continue to overlap. Yeah. And there's so much support there. So I stay busy. I do a lot of public speaking. Yeah. I love to write. I love to help veterans at the beginning and the end of every day. Yeah. It's all about helping vets. And that's what makes me happy. You know, uh, one area here that I always talk about in building our company is that in the Marine Corps, I was talking about the Marine Corps is either light green or dark green, right? And um, and it's funny that we're both from Illinois, both Marine Corps uh, uh, veterans, and yet this is the brotherhood here. And we don't we don't see, and I think today uh, race uh, and race relations and race understanding is, is so far way out of proportion. What would you say to that? Because, you know, sometimes guys even in the military deal with it, you know, this thing going on with the NFL. What would you say to somebody like that is watching this right yeah. now and having to deal with this issue? And for us, it's just, it's just a love for brother. And I wish more of America would have that aspect. But we experience it second nature in the Marine Corps because here's well, the thing, we, bullets aren't prejudiced. No, bullets, bullets don't know race. They nope. don't know gender. They yeah. don't know sexual orientation. Nope. And because we're so good and yeah. we can say this because and we're a little biased yeah. Yeah. we make it a non-issue because we have that luxury and whether it's racial integration gender integration your sexual orientation 
when we integrate those things as soldiers and as Marines, it doesn't even become a ripple in the pond because there's a lot of things we do great. Mm -hmm. Shooting our rifle and killing enemy, we, we're great. Mm -hmm. But we also follow orders, and that's something we're great at. So when our commanders, when our elected officials say do this, mm -hmm. we do it. Yep. And the, the benefits we gain from that it, it are so immense. And I'm proud to say that the first female infantry officer really? serving for deployed right now is from Echo Company, 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines. Get and I, I just wrote a, sh a short op-ed supporting her commitment and her her unique position to really redefine the standard. Not, not change the standard, she met the standard. But to say congratulations, and I called her, her commander and I said, just yeah. answer one question, yeah. is she crushing it? Yeah. And he said, absolutely. Yeah. Because there's no such thing as combat leadership, Matt. Just leadership. Leadership doesn't need to come from a man or woman or someone who's black or white. Yeah. Leadership is leadership. Yeah. And you either do that and you commit to it while you're serving, yeah. and then there's other people that have the capacity to continue to do that. And I, I think that's something I'm very fortunate to do as well is my leadership didn't stop when I left from Adi. It didn't stop when I left the Marine Corps. I still continue to lead these Marines and soldiers today. And I think that's something that, again, probably sustains me and helps me is that commitment of lifelong leadership because it's not a nine to five job. And when you think of it in those terms, I think you can gain so many great things from it. How did you deal with being a major, an officer in charge of men, respected, attention on deck, everybody stands up, people saluting, and then you get out. The civilian world doesn't know what a major is outside of major pain, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, that's true. So I, I never really thought about that. Really? That's a great question. That probably comes from a little age and experience and wisdom. You, you kind of become comfortable in your own level of coolness, I guess, just right. so to speak. And cool. I think that I get asked the question a lot too, is did being enlisted make you a better officer? And I always say it no, it did yeah. not. It, it made me absolutely appreciate the Young Marines time more. Mm -hmm. But I never was asked the question, did being an officer help you transition from the military mm -hmm. and then look at it from the other side? Yeah. I never really thought about that. But I think always staying mission focused, always having a purpose and staying connected has really probably helped me not deal with some of those issues, those transitional issues that a lot of guys go through. But for me, being in the military, being in the Marines is such a people business. And when you understand that and you're under command of great leaders that mentored me and then you can you can take those great pieces of advice and you can understand that every single marine every single soldier brings something different to the organization mm -hmm. and being able to leverage those talents that's what makes a great leader and i think that that is something that i talk about every day when i speak to private organizations about how you can apply that how you can apply some of the worst things we saw on the battlefield to the private sector about leadership and team building and overcoming adversity. And it all comes through a completely different lens from my perspective. But I think it has applications every single day in every sector. Sir, one last question before we wrap up. What's one thing you would share to a veteran, soon be veteran, leaving active duty, leaving the military, leaving a deployment, coming back home, and reintegrating back into society in transition? What bit of advice would you give them? I'd give them two, two great pieces of advice, and that is, one, stay connected to your network. Stay connected to the veteran network. Mm -hmm. it, it's immense, and allow yourself to expand outside of that. And the second thing is understand your value, understand right. your worth, because only our veteran community understands what they've done. And you have to know what your value is. Mm -hmm. You have to know how to be able to translate that into the private sector. You need to know how to translate that as an entrepreneur or as an artist or whatever it is you choose to do. You have to know what your value is. And I think a lot of people struggle with that because we led a life of service, mm -hmm. a commitment to serving our nation, to serving others, to helping those that couldn't help themselves, right? Right. So we're geared to think this way. Yeah. And when we transition from the military, our natural instinct is to give it away. So that's something hard that a lot of people don't see when they transition out of the military is your service and your commitment has value. So I would ask you, what is your hourly rate? What are you worth? Yeah. And obviously a guy that did four years in the Marine Corps or in the Navy or in the Army, you have to measure that yeah. compared to a guy that did 24 years in the Marine Corps or the Navy. So you need to weigh that out, but understand that as you move forward, there's so many great opportunities out there for you. And if you are open to expand other networks, it just gets better and better. And this is a, this is a prime example of being here with you today. So thanks. Awesome. Well, yeah. opportunities abound. 
If a uh, uh, former enlisted turned officer from Waukegan, Illinois with a 1.24 yes. GPA could be a best-selling author, imagine what you can do. This is the Living Money Smart Veteran Entrepreneur Series. Thanks for tuning in. Sir, Semper Fi. Semper Fi, brother. Right. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, and until we meet again, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click below here and click the notification tab to make sure you be alerted next time we upload an episode. And until we meet again, continue to live smart, continue to love smart, and be money smart today.